There are a lot of things you don't know about me, Miss Novak. In fact, there might be a lot of things we don't know about each other. People seldom go to the trouble of scratching the surface of things to find the inner truth. Well, I really wouldn't care to scratch your surface, Mr. Crawlick, because I know exactly what I'd find. Instead of a heart, a handbag. Instead of a soul, a suitcase. And instead of an intellect, a cigarette lighter. Which doesn't work. Well, that's very nicely put. Yes, comparing my intellect with a cigarette lighter that doesn't work. That's a very interesting mixture of poetry and meanness. Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Geneva. And I'm Tatum. We are two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week, we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us, to tears, to laughter, and everything in between. We celebrate the craft of filmmaking, as well as the unique and personal ways we find meaning in the movies we watch. Well, Tatum, want to share with the people what you've been watching this week? Yes, people. Gather round. <laughs> Gather round, children. Gather round, everybody, because Hear the I have some news that's going to blow your mind. Uh, not really. Um, but <laughs> so <laughs> I realized that last week when I was kind of talking about the copious thing amounts of things that I watched during the week that I had COVID, uh, in addition to like the two full series and eight movies that I watched, I also watched an another entire series of a oh. show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I watched uh, Amazon Prime's uh, A League of Their Own, which is kind of a spinoff of the movie that came out, I don't know, in the 80s or the 90s. I don't remember. Um, but yes, it is a show that kind of follows a um, a female professional uh, so baseball, not softball, baseball group uh, that is kind of taking over because all of the men are going off to war, but people still want their baseball. And so they're like, well, I guess we have to hire women to be professional baseball players to keep us all entertained. Um, it was very good. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not surprised it was not renewed for a second season, unfortunately. Um, but I would say that it is a very, um, it's a very, it's a very captivating show in terms of how it talks about um, just kind of the, the dynamic in that era of being a woman and um, just coolness of sports as well and how they bring people together and <laughs> um but just kind of showing how women can really embrace <laughs> their independence when they leave home and go join this team and some of them are you know leaving husbands up behind without asking for their permission and all of these different things um and also i found it to be very very profound on um on a queer level because Surprise, surprise, on a baseball team of multiple, of lots of women, uh, several of them are queer, um, including, well, uh, okay, I won't say that because I guess it's kind of a spoiler, but um, there are people in this show that are queer on the baseball team, and we kind of get to learn more about their journeys as time goes on, and there was one particularly um, really moving moment I don't want to spoil anything. So I'm trying to like, I don't want to spoil anything. So if you haven't watched A League of Their Own, it's a very, very good show. Um, it's a really, I would say that if you haven't really stepped into the space of like queer media, this is a really good introduction for you um, because it's, it's, it's very much so just talked about on, you know, just a human level. These are humans that happen to be queer during a time when they're just kind of learning about who they are as women and playing sports that they love and, and feeling camaraderie with their teammates and also, you know, touching on the, the politics of the time and how, like, how welcoming or unwelcoming society was of the LGBTQ plus community at the time. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really, really great show. I would highly recommend. Um, it's, it's a really pleasant watch. Honestly, you can kind of just sit back and enjoy um there is one particular episode that is very upsetting um but 
overall, um, I would say it's a really pleasant watch. It's a great show. The acting is really good. Um, so yeah, that is, um, a league of their own on Amazon prime. So what are, um, quick question. What are your thoughts on the original movie by from the, was it the nineties, the, the movie with Tom Hanks and Gina Davis? And yeah, I haven't seen it in probably 20 years. <laughs> um, wait, what, wait, what year are we in? Yeah. It's probably been like 20 years since I've seen it, but I remember really liking it, watching it when I was little. Um, I would love to rewatch it at some point. Uh, cause I remember it being a lot of fun, but who knows, maybe watching it now with my 2023 20, eyes, it would feel a little bit more sexist I, I, I'm not sure um but I loved it at the time so yeah that's my main memory of that um so I've only been watching two other things um I have continued my watch of the FX on Hulu show Reservation Dogs this show is absolutely incredible um the way that it it starts on this premise of 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 a young boy who is in this group of high school friends he commits suicide and the rest of the story is just kind of learning about the lives of the different people that were in his life. So we learn about his uncle, his, his mom, his cousins, you know, the, the police officer in his community, all of these different people and how all of them were impacted by this, but also learning about their individual lives in terms of flashbacks of them growing up and their their goals for their future and and the struggles of you know being a native american who lives on a reservation versus the people who have left the reservation and those dynamics um and somehow it manages to tackle these really intense topics in in a way that's not depressing it's in a way that really just invites you in to engage um and really get to know these people and it's also quite funny as well um, so uh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't speak highly enough of this show. It's very, very good. Um, I'm a little bit over halfway through season two. Um, I look forward to continuing my watch. Um, it's, it's a really, really, really good show. Um, it's almost kind of an anthology series almost. Cause like each episode there's outliers to this, but a lot of times it's like this one episode, we're really going to focus on this person and then this person and then this person. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really, really great. So highly, highly, highly recommend Reservation Dogs. Um, each season is only 10 episodes. Each episode is less than 30 minutes and there's only three seasons. So it's not like you're, you know, starting a huge, you know, project that's going to take a long time. Um, you could watch it probably pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, so that's Reservation Dogs. Um, and then last thing I, I went to go see Martin Scorsese's most recent film, Killers of the Flower Moon, based off of the book, um, which is also based off of the Osage, uh, I, I would say, ethnic cleansing <laughs> that uh, occurred um, among the Osage people in America uh, in the early 1900s. Um, I, I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before. Uh, my relationship with Martin Scorsese is very complex. Uh, his movies, for me, are either a very, very big hit or a very big miss. Um, it isn't often that I watch one of his films that I think, oh, that was okay. It's either like, oh, I loved that movie or oh, I didn't really, I really didn't get it. Um, this film, I got it. This is my second favorite Scorsese film of all time. I think that it is an absolute masterpiece um there I remember going into it I was a little bit concerned about having this particular story told by a white man who is in no way personally connected to um the subject matter um but I think that being considered he did such a great job I mean hearing stories about how he had an initial version of the script written but then after interviewing Osage people he rewrote the whole thing basically to reflect um their reality um you know the costume designer is an osage person which i think really shows in like the authenticity of what we're seeing on screen um the movie is very long but i was engaged from start to finish um other than when brendan fraser stepped on screen which i was like what 
the actual F is going on right now. Um, did you deserve that Oscar? I'm very confused. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, I do, I do wish there was a little bit more or a lot more of Molly and a little bit less of, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character. I forget his name. Um, but you know, th those are nitpicks and, at the end of the day, I think Martin Scorsese did a very good job given where he's coming from. Um, and I think this is an absolute masterpiece of a film. I think everybody should see it. Um, I, unfortunately, uh, part of the blame I put on myself, the other part of it, I put on the American education system, but I did not really know about this event uh, that happened over years uh, in in the United States in the early 1900s. I'm really glad that I know about it now. It made me want to learn even more and dive more into um, just the history of this. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I learned so much about this particular tribe of, I think they're called tribes, um, of the Native American people. And um, it's a powerful, powerful film that is impeccably made and just overwhelming to watch. I, I, I absolutely loved it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's Killers of the Flower Moon. I, I would love to talk about it on this podcast at some point. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to go super in depth on it more than that, I guess, at this moment, but incredible, incredible film. Please go see it. I would also recommend seeing it in theaters because it is a long movie. And I feel like if you watch it at home, you're going to have you're going to get up and go to the bathroom and then you're going to grab something to eat and then you're going to look at your phone. And this is really just a movie where I feel like you have to see it in the theater. Do I think it should have an intermission? Yes, it should. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it doesn't. So that being said, see it in a theater and take as minimum bathroom breaks as possible. <laughs> but there you go. That's what I've been watching. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you ended on that because I also saw Killers of the Flower Moon this week, which, you know, we'll tell you how far in advance we are recording this episode. <laughs> yes. Geneva and I tend to see things like right after they come out. So. <laughs> At least things like this. True. Um, yeah, I could not agree more. What a towering achievement this movie is. I was you know, concerned going in for a similar reason for you, also because of the the length. I'm often not good with longer movies, but this movie, the pacing and the editing, and, you know, so much respect to Thelma Shoemaker, who is long, Martin Scorsese's longtime editing Love um, her. partner. She is absolutely incredible. This movie is so well paced. It flows together beautifully. The performances are all incredible. Um, the sense of place and setting is perfect. The way that weaves together these different stories and um, really creates a sense of the scale and the horror of what happened is fantastic. Um, if I had to one levy to levy one tiny piece of criticism against it, and this is very mild, that's not Brendan Fraser. It's not actually Brendan Fraser. <laughs> actually, that bothered me a lot less than it did some other people. But I feel like. Leonardo DiCaprio is a little bit over the top in mm. his repulsiveness, especially right from the jump. I wish he'd scaled it back a little bit. In terms maybe, of his performance or in terms of the writing of his character? or In terms of his performance. Okay. I at no point ever see what Molly sees in him. <laughs> the entire time I'm like, he's what is there to, what is there to charm you about this guy? He's just a, a weasel. Um, I wish he'd toned it down a little bit at least at the beginning when they're still courting and brought in a little bit more of the charm and then kind of unveiled more of the repulsiveness as the story goes along but again that's a very small criticism because overall I think he is generally very good and of course Lily Gladstone who is an actress that the only other thing that I've seen her in is a film a Kelly Reichardt film called Certain Women from a few years that was ago. That was the only thing I'd seen her in as mm -hmm. well. Which she is astounding in. I have not been able to stop thinking about her performance since I've seen it. Everyone out there, go watch Certain Women. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen Stewart is also in her segment of the film and she's great as well. The two of them have amazing chemistry and they play off each other so well. But yeah, Lily Gladstone, what an incredible talent and she's so wonderful in this movie. She completely anchors it 
and she her you know by the nature of how the role is written she is such a quiet character and yet you can see everything that is going on beneath her eyes it is a really really wonderful performance and um yeah, I think this movie is fantastic, and I'm glad that it's getting seen and, and that it's getting a lot of attention, and um, I hope it continues to bring attention to the story and then also just to Martin Scorsese's work in general, because he is, you know, a... Don't a, say it. Don't, don't, don't say it. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what, what did you think I was going to say? That he's getting old and he might not have many films oh, left Oh, no, in I wasn't going to say that. I was okay. just going to say like, that he's a great it. director, you know, even if not all of his films, like, speak to all of us. And, you know, I, I've actually only seen a handful of Martin Scorsese's films. I've liked all the ones that I've seen, but um, there's quite a few of his classics that I've not caught up with yet. Um, but he is such an incredible talent and, you know, he's such a thoughtful person. Like it's been really delightful to see this whole, um, you know, with all, all the actors not being able to promote Martin Scorsese has done a lot of the promotion and he's such a fun, wonderful, warm, thoughtful presence in interviews. It's been great to see him out there doing his thing, <laughs> wearing his little glasses, doing his little TikToks with his daughter, um, and talking about movies and, and the art form. And he's been such a great force for promoting um, independent and foreign cinema as well, which is wonderful that he's put his voice toward that. So, And yeah. also preserving old cinema. Mm, yes. Like, he yes. is totally into that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm here for it. I'm so yeah. here for it. He's a huge, huge advocate for that, which is fantastic. So, yeah, that's Killers of the Flower Moon. If you've not seen it, go and see it. Um, I hope it'll still be in theater. Well, I mean, if it's not in theaters when this episode's coming out, it will be re-released for Oscar season guaranteed mm -hmm. because yeah. this will be nominated for several yeah. Oscars. <laughs> I think it will win Best Picture. That's my prediction. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. We'll have to see. But um, yeah. it's definitely got a strong chance. I, for the record, I've uh, as soon as I walked out, I reserved put a hold on it on on the original book on libby and i was like a hundred thin line <laughs> so we'll yep. see if by the time oscar season rolls around i finally had a chance to read the book yep um yeah anyway so killers of the flower moon uh another recent movie recent release actually that i saw this week was anatomy of a fall which is a i'm going to see it this week Ooh, be interested to hear what you think I'm this so is pumped. a french film um I will not then spoil very much except to say that I think it is very good. Um, the performance of the lead actress, Sandra Huller in particular, is wonderful. It really made me want to go back and rewatch Anatomy of a Murder, uh, which the title's clearly riffing on. But I'm still kind of unpicking my thoughts about it, but it is a very... Um, yeah, it's this really well done study of how how much what it means to be in a relationship with a person and how much can build up over the years in terms of thoughts and secret um, grudges and impressions of one another, how little you can know another person when you live alongside them until something happens. And um, it's just very interesting the way the, the story is told. I don't think it's a perfect film. I think there are some criticisms I could levy against it, but I think it's really interesting. And yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. Um, let's see. What else did I see this week? So I saw a couple of older films that were kind of okay. Uh, I saw Follow the Fleet, which is a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers comedy. It's okay. It's definitely not toward the top of the list for them for me um in large part because there's this really obnoxious subplot with fred astaire's best friend who's just a a real jerk to be honest and it kind of brings down the rest even though fred astaire and ginger rogers themselves are very cute together um but you know always love to see fred astaire dancing around in a sailor suit so that was fun um i saw a film called the men very different vibe which is a 1950 film it is actually marlon brando's film debut mm. it's the first movie that he ever made um starring alongside how Tari old was he like 19 no i mean um streetcar named desire i think was only the year after that so how old 
old was he? I I have no idea. Yeah, I have no I, conception. I can't tell either. how old people I'm are. I'm assuming like mid twenties, <laughs> but it's okay, <laughs> kind of hard to tell. Um, yeah. So, starring alongside Teresa Wright, who I'm a huge fan of. Um, but it's kind of an interesting, not great, but interesting movie. It's a very much a message picture about let's raise an issue that people may not be aware of in 1950 America and kind of help them to understand it better. And the the issue that they're raising is veterans who have been paralyzed by the war and ha- are having to adjust to life in a wheelchair or, you know, life without the use of some of their limbs. So Marlon Brando is a veteran who's come back paralyzed and Teresa Wright is his fiance who, you know, she keeps insisting, I still love you. I still want to be with you. And he has this really hard time accepting the idea that he could still marry a woman and have a normal life and be a functional member of society. He kind of just wants to, you know, feels like he he can't be a person anymore because of what um, the, the physical trauma that he's faced. And so um, I think it's pretty, I really like the movie when it's focusing on his relationships with the other members of this clinic that he's in. Um, there's a couple other actors who are really fun. One of them, incidentally, is Leonard from Community. <laughs> Back, you know, he's like 30 what? years old and cracking jokes, which is great. <laughs> that is... That is like my favorite piece of trivia I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that is so funny. He's so great. Yeah. And it's just very... Before you know, he started his famous YouTube page. <laughs> right. <laughs> Years before he started his YouTube page. Um, yeah. But so it's very, you know, it's a very well done empathetic movie toward the the plight of paralyzed veterans and what it means to live in a society that does not really have the level of awareness and understanding and empathy toward handicapped people that our society today does. I mean, not that our society today is perfect when it comes to that, but um, so I think it's a, it's an interesting picture in that regard. Um, Again, very much a message picture. It's not really, the point of it is not really art, quote unquote. It's more, let's help, you know, kind of raise awareness about this issue. So what is this movie called? It's called The Men. Men or the men? The men. Okay, because it, it yeah, not a very descriptive title. It reminds me of. I wonder how much it's related to the movie Born on the Fourth of July, which I don't think you've mm. seen. Have you? No, I've been wanting to see that. That's uh, Tom Cruise, right? Or yeah, am I yeah, it's Tom that up Cruise. With something else. Okay. Um, I think it was his first Oscar nomination or something like that. But um, I've heard really good things about that movie and his performance. Yeah. I wonder how much they're related because the way that you're describing this movie sounds very similar to Born on the Fourth of July yeah. because he is, a, you know, a, a veteran who's come back from war and lost his legs and is kind of pondering, you know, do I do I still have value in society given that I no longer have legs and that's kind of his own emotional journey that he's figuring out because other people are like we still love you we still want you here but he's kind of going on his own um, emotional journey figuring that out so it sounds kind of similar yeah I'd love to see born on the fourth of July and compare them if I had to guess I would guess that the men is probably a bit more kind of optimistic and taking less of a sort of critical view of America and um, mm. the place mm-hmm. of veterans in their society by, you know, by virtue of the fact that this is World War II versus the Vietnam War in um, Born on the 4th, 4th of July. Um, it The men does wrap up pretty quickly with a like, you know, there's a moment of doubt, but then we do finally reconcile and everything is, it's not quite happy, happily ever after, but you know, it's a, it's a wrapped up in a, well, they're going to be okay. I don't know if Born on the 4th of July ends on a similar note or not i don't really know yeah i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that movie it's not a bad movie but i also feel like it's kind of an oscar bait movie Mm. (laughs) but you know like oscar bait movies they're not bad movies but it's just kind of like okay you're hitting the beats you're hitting you know you're checking off the boxes that are gonna but Mm -hmm. anyway i did like tom cruise's performance though Mm. yeah i'm as always i always love his as we've said many times tom cruise legitimately great actor he's never had a performance that i'm like eh, nah i'm always like i give me more tom cruise yeah (laughs) not in the real world give me more fictional tom Mm -hmm. cruise yeah i have to say i mean i love the mission impossible movies but i can't wait until he can no longer do them and hopefully he can go back to working with really cool 
drama directors and trying to get Oscars and stuff like that. I think he wants to die on Mission. I think he wants to die in a Mission Impossible set. I think that's his his well, life. He's goal. got one more movie to achieve that to we'll be see. the actor that goes down in history as like at the age of sixty eight he died jumping off of Mount Everest trying to catch a tiger. But, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like the, Tom Cruise. That's the type of story he wants to have. He doesn't want to have an Elvis death. You know. <laughs> yeah. No shame, Elvis. I'm sorry. Now I'm just picturing Tom Cruise in <laughs> RRR where all the tigers and the lions yes! are leaping out of cages. Yes. <laughs> he uh, should work with that director i'm blanking on his name but um that would be oh great. ss rajmuli yes thank you the man who i got to see for a live Q&A yes! at the music yes! box theater in chicago last year oh i'm so jealous that's amazing the night i will never forget for the rest of my life okay speaking of amazing action movies actually <laughs> I, I have one last movie to recommend <laughs> which i'm looking at my letterbox and i'm like ooh, why did i only write that for i'm, I'm gonna raise it half a star but i watched the movie attack the block which has been recommended to me for quite a while and so i finally watched it and it's so much fun highly recommend this is um I don't think it's his film debut, but it's kind of the thing that put John Boyega on the map before oh, he was in Star I Wars. Oh, I saw you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It is a small action, kind of indie-ish film vibes. It's pretty contained. It's set in um, London. I don't know enough about the geography of London to know if it's central or east, but among um, a group of teenage boys who um, they live in the projects, you know, they don't have a great situation they kind of spend their days going around on bicycles and mugging people um, but they're this really tight-knit group of friends and one day aliens <laughs> attack the block where they live and so it's kind of like almost home alone esque like we gotta gear up and defend ourselves except it's really brutal and violent and r-rated and it's amazing it's huh. really good it is so much fun um the characters are, uh, you just, you know, they sort of start out and they seem, you know, it's like alienating that they're, um, these are the kids from the wrong side of the tracks. And then immediately the movie starts peeling all of that away and they just become the most warm, lovable group that you just want to see succeed. And every time something happens to one of them, you feel it. Um, it's a really empathetic movie but again it's also really brutal <laughs> it's a movie that's very much about you know it has its eye on the system and the way that it's failed these kids and the way that they have to look after each other and kind of create um, a community and a system that will look after them in the way that the the government and the the adults in their lives has failed to um but yeah, mostly it's just really, really fun. And John Boyega is incredible. <laughs> I don't know. He's playing a teenager. I don't know if he's, I'm assuming he's probably actually like 19 or early 20s um, in this movie. But he's, his character is more taciturn, but he does so much acting with his face and his eyes. And he just expresses so much as kind of the leader of the group that everyone looks to, but is also just a scared kid who doesn't really know what he's doing and is just making it up as he goes along and the way that he's able to develop as over the course of the movie and and grow and find you know resources and courage that he didn't know he had which I always love and so yeah attack the block great little movie highly recommend apparently he was 20 20 wow mm -hmm. wow 20 and so much star power where what has he been doing I know he's been doing things but he was in the woman's game more that's right. He was. He was in yeah. a smaller role, not a tiny role, but um, in the yeah, Woman King. In yeah, yeah. I mean, his role wasn't that small. Yeah, no. I, guess I mean, that's he true. wasn't like one of the main characters in the army yeah. troop, but he was still, you know. A, mm -hmm. Yeah. He yeah. Well, he's character. the because he's like the the prince of the. He's like the king, right? Mm -hmm. At the time. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So. That is what I've watched this week. Let us move on to The Shop Around the Corner. So today we're talking about The Shop Around the Corner from 1940. This movie is directed by Ernst Lubitsch and stars Jimmy Stewart, Maureen Sullivan, and Frank Morgan. The script for this movie is an adaptation of a play called Perfumery, which was written by the Hungarian playwright Miklos Lajlo. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> I am probably not. 
Um, it was first performed in Budapest in 1937, which is why this um, story takes place in Budapest. The basic story, which is about two people who keep fighting in real life while simultaneously falling in love through anonymous correspondence, has been reinterpreted many times. Most notably, there was a 1949 Judy Garland musical called In the Good Old Summertime. I'm not really a fan of that movie, but that's conversation for another time. Uh, there was a 1963 Broadway musical called She Loves Me, but most famously, um, it was remade as the 1998 rom-com You've Got Mail, which starred Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And you you like that movie? I do. Yeah. Okay. I love that okay. movie. I love both of these movies. They're very different. They're kind of doing different things, but I think they're both very good. So The Shop Around the Corner is the third of four movies that Jimmy Stewart and Margaret Sullivan made together. They had actually been friends since the late 1920s when they were both part of a theater troupe called the University Players. On the first film they made together, which is called Next Time We Love, Stewart was still new to the movies and he was awkward and nervous. So Sullivan spent time coaching him to be more comfortable on camera and helping him to refine his on-star persona. That movie was a hit and it helped to make Jimmy Stewart a star. There are rumors that Jimmy Stewart had unrequited romantic feelings for Margaret Sullivan for years. I don't know if that's true, but it really lends some poignancy to a lot of the scenes they have toward the end of the movie where he's kind of looking longingly at her, um, which I really love. Ernst Lubitsch was a German-born director. He emigrated to the United States in 1922. Today, he's best known for the light, sophisticated comedies that he made in the 1930s and 40s. Lubitsch and the film's screenwriter, Samson Raphaelson, incorporated some of their own experiences of working in shops before getting into movie making when they were uh, working on this film. Um, and I found this really interesting quote from the TCM Turner Classic Movies website, their page about this movie. It says, At the film's January 5th, 1940 premiere at Radio City Music Hall, Lubitsch remarked, I have known just such a little shop in Budapest. The feeling between the boss and those who work for him is pretty much the same the world over, it seems to me. Everyone is afraid of losing his job, and everyone knows how little human worries can affect his job. If the boss has a touch of dyspepsia, better be careful not to step on his toes. When things have gone well with him, the whole staff reflects his good humor. All right, so um, I'm trying to think when when I first watched this movie. I think I may have watched it for the first time in college. I don't really have a specific memory attached to I it. I am surprised. Uh-huh. I feel like you would have seen this movie right out of the womb. This movie like, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's crazy to me. I know, yeah. Um, I feel like I watched it around the same time that I watched A Philadelphia Story for the first time. What? Which I did not see until college. My whole perception of you is changing right now. <laughs> what in the world? That's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, regardless of when I first saw it, I pretty much fell in love with it right away. It's become a classic Christmas watch for me. This is kind of one of my personal pantheon of, of Christmas movies. It's just... I Like I said, I love this movie and I love You've Got Mail both. I think they're both excellent, but they're trying to do very different things. And one of the things that I really love about this movie is that it is sort of in the rom-com genre, but it's also kind of not. It's really not, it's not laugh out loud funny. It is very romantic and there are comedic moments, but it's also very melancholic in places. And, you know, the holidays are so great for that, where there's that sort of reevaluation of your life and who is important to you and trying to figure out who to spend the holidays with. Um, this movie really has this sense of all of these questions of kind of who we are and the community that we build around ourselves. I think it's very, I don't know if insightful is the right word, but you know, it really captures what it feels like to work in a small, tight-knit office with an overbearing boss, <laughs> which I have experienced before. But that that weird sort of dynamics that those weird sort of dynamics that develop where you and your coworkers are all kind of a family and you're all looking out for one another and sometimes you get on each other's nerves, but you're all kind of there for each other. But at the same time, all of those connections are completely artificial and they're dependent on circumstances. And you feel you spend so much time with each other. And you know each other in certain ways so well. And yet at the same time, 
you don't know each other at all because you don't really see each other outside of work. And so there are ways in which you're so intimate and yet so distant. And I think that's a really interesting thing that this movie captures really well. Um, the way that we become different people when we're at work than we are in our normal lives. And yeah, the the arc of Mr. Modicek as this sort of overbearing boss who is <laughs> really unpleasant to work for, but then the way the movie kind of humanizes him and, and gives him a chance to have a better, you know, kind of look towards something better, I think is, I just find incredibly touching. Um, and then I just think the chemistry between Jimmy Stewart and Maureen Sullivan is really good. So yeah, that's what I love about this movie briefly. Um, Tatum, this is your first watch of this movie. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? So I want to start off by saying, so this movie I've heard, I've heard of the shop around the corner, but every time I hear the title, my initial thought is of the movie, the shop on main street which is a very different film. It is a Czechoslovakian film from, I think, the 1960s that follows uh, an old woman who owns a store and she's Jewish and someone takes over her store because Jewish people cannot own stores anymore and her town is... People keep being taken and taken... Very different tones, very different movies. (laughs) I love The Shop on Main Street. We will talk about it on this podcast at some point. It's a fantastic, phenomenal film. Um... But anyway, we're talking about the shop uh, around the corner. So if if during this podcast I accidentally say the shop on Main Street, I mean the shop That's around the corner. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> but okay, I just needed to say that at first. Um, so I think I think it's been established on this podcast that romantic movies can be a struggle for me sometimes. So I was a little bit hesitant going into this movie. I was kind of like. I don't, I don't really know what to expect. Um, I also have been in many circumstances with people where they've told me this is a Christmas movie and I've watched it and been like, this is not a Christmas movie. This is a movie where it is a Christmas movie. Oh, good. <laughs> so Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> um, it was, it was nice to get into the Christmas spirit a little bit, um, I guess in yeah. November. While we're... As I watch this movie on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yes. Um, but yeah, so my thoughts on this film, I I finished the movie and I wanted to watch it again. And let me explain why. So I was very, I was confused while watching this movie because I think I went in expecting it to be something that it wasn't, which, le- which lends itself to what you were saying, Geneva. I thought this was going to be kind of like a... Um, you know, like a romantic comedy, pure romantic comedy type of film. And so I was very... Maybe a little con- more screwball, a little more zany. That yeah, sort of thing. a little bit more like, um, oh man, what's that movie that's like like the classic first rom-com movie? What, what's that movie? Oh, Chima? It Happened One Night. Yeah, I was expecting it to be more of that kind of vibe, like very specifically romantic comedy. And so I was confused because I was like, oh, this is funny. And then we learn about um we, we learn about Krolik we introduce we're introduced to this concept of him receiving a letter through this like mailbox thing and I'm like okay cool and then we don't really see that come back for a while and then we're learning about Modicek and I'm like okay so this isn't a romantic movie and then we're thrown back into the I'm like wait okay so I was very confused while watching this film because I literally finished it and was like, I'm going to watch it again. But because I literally found this on Amazon Prime when it was going to expire in like six hours, (laughs) by the time I sat down to watch it again, it was no longer on Amazon Prime. (laughs) So, um, so I, 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 I'm very confused with this movie because the, the bits and pieces that I, I, I see this movie in separate pieces. I see the romantic part of it. I see the the Matichek kind of side of it in terms of his personal story. And then I see the Krolik side of it where he's kind of figuring out, do I stay here? Do I go work somewhere else? Like, what's my value as a man with a job, without a job? I kind of see it in these three different segments. 
each of the individual segments, I really, really, really like a lot. I like them a lot. But the format in which how they were put together in this movie, because I was expecting this movie to be something else, I was a little bit confused. So I think... I think if I watched it again, I could really, really get behind this movie. Because again, the individual segments, I loved them. But I finished the movie and I was like, I wanted more romance. Like, I felt like the romance was kind of tacked on. But then I was like, but I don't want less of the other parts because I liked the other part. So so I was just very confused. So I think... I think that if I were to watch it again, I could fully get behind it. But I just was very, I was confused. So yeah, yeah, I don't know it if is... that makes sense, but. No, yeah, that totally makes sense because this is so much more, I think it's a really aptly named movie. It's called The Shop Around the Corner. And it is really the story of a shop about a workplace and the people who work there and the way their lives intersect. And it's focusing on two um kind of storylines in particular, Mr. Matichek and his kind of relationship to Krolik and to himself um, and Krolik's relationship to Clara Novak. But it is really an ensemble piece to me. And that's one of the things that I love about it and that makes it so much, you know, it makes it very different, again, from You've Got Mail, because You've Got Mail is very much a story about two people. It's a story about Which was, again, why I was confused watching mm -hmm. this, because I've heard so many people talk about this in relation to You've Got Mail, and I've mm -hmm. seen You've Got Mail, and it's very much so, this is a movie that is about this love story, and mm -hmm. mostly just this love story. And so that was what I went into this movie kind of expecting it to be. Yeah, because yeah, for this movie, it's the love story and the sort of um, gimmick, for lack of a better word, you know, the, the hook of it is this idea of what if two people are co-workers and they fight in real life, but in, you know, they didn't don't know they're anonymous pen pals and they really like each other. Um, you know, that's that's interesting. That's an interesting hook. And it's very easy to adapt into other situations as this has been done many times over the years. But, you know, looking at it in this sort of original form, this isn't the original form because it was originally a play, but I, from what I could tell, this is pretty, this is very similar to the play. I think they, I don't think they changed a whole lot when they adapted the play to the movie. I might be wrong about that. But it is really interesting kind of seeing that original kernel of there's that interesting hook, but it's these two people who are existing within a larger context. And that larger context is this shop and kind of the system of, you know, capitalism <laughs> in general, you know, this sort of living in a society which is experiencing an economic downturn. Everyone is kind of on the edge of, you know, disaster, losing your job in this movie is very clearly a really bad thing that could happen. And so that adds a bit of tension and a bit of stakes. And so that heightens all of the um, the way that Clara and Krolik are rivals to each other, that they're kind of squabbling over um, their dominance within their workplace. There's stakes to that because of how bad it would be if one of them was to lose their job, how much that would ruin at least or at least set them back for many years, um, any hopes they have for the future. And I think that's really interesting. I think I, I think that deepens this movie in a certain way. It kind of adds extra dimension and it makes this movie, um, you know, it adds on to that sort of light romance that is very pleasant and sweet and it's perfect and I love it. Um, but it also adds other things to think about and other kind of um, ways of interacting and, and being a person and having relationships with other people that are going on alongside all of that. Um, do you want to go through the plot a bit and uh, we can kind of talk through some of some of this film and, and the things that happen? Sure. Let me just start by saying I, I, while watching this movie, especially in the beginning, I was like, I wonder if anyone has ever done a drinking game where it's <laughs> every single time someone says, Mr. Matichek, oh, you take gosh. a drink. Because How you would be plastered. Incredibly hammered you would be. Like, you might die. 
because <laughs> because Mr. Modicek is I <laughs> don't it, forget Mrs. Modicek and Modicek and Company. I, uh, so many just, times. It said so many times. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. Th- that was like the main thing in the beginning. I was like, okay, I definitely know who this is because mm-hmm. we've said his name. Yeah. You know, 60 times in the first five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so this movie, it opens with a title card talking about how this is, it says, this is the story of Matichek and company, of Mr. Matichek and the people who work for him. It is just around the corner from Andrasi Street on Balta Street in Budapest, Hungary. And when I tell you, I've been to Budapest, and the primary reason that I went to Budapest was because of this movie, even though this movie is very clearly filmed in Hollywood. Wait, what? <laughs> It's a delightful, delightful city. Anyone who is planning to go to Europe, I recommend Budapest. It's beautiful. Um, anyway, so we open with the scene where all of the employees are arriving at the start of the day. So we've got Pirovich, who is, um, he's like a middle-aged, kind of married father. Um, he's got a big mustache. <laughs> I snapchatted an image from the the film to my friend and she asked if it was one of the Marx brothers. <laughs> <Made me laugh. laughs> um then there's Pepe who is the errand boy who I guess is supposed to be like 19 but though he looks like 32. <laughs> yeah, I was confused by that. I was like they're talking to him like he's very young. Mhm. He, he I mean, he doesn't look old, but he doesn't look like a he teenager. Like, he doesn't look like a teenager, no. As opposed to the errand boy at the end, he actually mm-hmm. looks like a teenager. Yeah, he's believable, 17 years. Well, it makes you, I guess it makes you wonder how long Pepe's been in this role. Like, maybe just time I to promote him to, the, to a Clark. Yeah. Um, Got to start pulling in that health insurance at some point. Yeah. <sighs> Um, so we've got, uh, Flora and Alona who are not major characters in this story, but are kind of two other women who work in this shop. We've got Vadish, who is this <laughs> really just absolutely slime ball. Um, you know, he loves to dress well. He loves to flirt with women. He's always saying little things to get people to cause dissension and get people worked up. He's always trying to poke his nose in and cause trouble and everyone hates him um but then we've got Krolik who Alfred Krolik who's played by Jimmy Stewart uh Krolik has worked at the shop for the longest he's been there about nine years and he's the head salesman he's basically number two you know to Mr. Modicek and they have this sort of um at the beginning of the movie it's kind of a father-son-ish relationship you know there's kind of this expectation that Krolik is going to take over the shop when when Matichek retires. Um, but so I just love this opening scene as they're all arriving and we're kind of getting a sense of their personality and the way that the shop functions. Like Pepe and Pirovich arrive at the same time and Pepe is like, what is the point of us arriving early? Like, I see you, you see me. The boss isn't here. He's not going to be impressed by us arriving so early and give us a raise. Like, why are we even doing this? Um which I thought was funny. Um, we get a sense early on, you know, of again, of the economic situation, because Pirovich mentions that his kid is sick. And in order to afford a doctor, they're going to, he and his wife are going to need to tighten their belts for a while. Um, Krolik has actually just come from dinner with the Matichek's at their house, which is kind of like a, a big step in their relationship. And so they talk about that a bit. And Vadish is like, <laughs> Krolik talks about how he had a little too much of the, the goose. And then Vadish is like, oh, you didn't like the goose? And Krolik is like, wait a second, when did I ever say I didn't like the goose? No, 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 no. <laughs> kind of causing trouble right away. Um, and then Matichek arrives and he like, he looks at the window display and he's like, who put that thing there? And someone's like, I did. Is it okay? And Matichek's like, yeah, I guess it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, oh, man, the, you know, the, like, having to constantly be on edge, hoping that your boss is going to be fine with what you're doing. Like, you know, it's a it's a relatable situation to be in. So Unfortunately, anyway. it's a common Common yeah, situation. Very common situation. Yeah. Yeah. Any any thoughts about this opening scene in general or just about the, the characters as we're getting introduced to them? Well... I'm going to say something that might sound like heresy to some people, and that's fine. But but Jimmy Stewart kind of reminds me a little bit of Steve Martin in the sense that I feel like Jimmy Stewart has looked like he was 60 ever since he was like <laughs> as young as we've seen him in movies. Mm-hmm. I, 
you know, because I feel like this movie, you know, he's not a young, you know, he's not like 25 years old, but he's also not that old either. But I don't know. I feel like he's supposed to be kind of young ish and he looks like he's 60 to me. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's fine to look 60, but I don't know. He's just someone where every single time I see him in something, I'm like, when is he going to look? Look young. Like not that age or older. (laughs) He was 32 in this movie. I just looked it up. Which, you know, you know, that's not young. It's not old. It's just, it's just, you know, 30 age is a number. I mean, he's got such a distinctive look. I saw this, um, I don't remember the exact phrasing, but I, I saw some quote by Ernst Lubitsch talking about why he wanted to cast Jimmy Stewart in this role. And it was all about like, well, he's not that really, he's not really that attractive, which is great for the role, which is hilarious. I mean, he's just very tall and, and, you know, very tall. I I saw a mm-hmm. letterbox review that was like, I just love how in every movie J- Jimmy Stewart's <laughs> in, he's like five feet taller than yeah. everyone else on screen. It's so true. Except it's when so he's true. standing next to John Wayne, who is freaking massive somehow even taller yeah um and he wears he has a hat on like dude what um anyway this is a huge tangent um but yeah i mean that opening sequence i think i think it was helpful for me to kind of establish the vibe of these people together because initially i was kind of confused i was like oh is this person a customer what's going on there's a lot of people here and then I was like, oh, no, everyone works here. <laughs> and They're all arriving before uh, before this shop opens in the morning. Yeah. yeah and, and I remember particularly liking the, um, the introduction to um, Perovich's character. I really like him in this movie. Mm-hmm. I think he's, he's like a, he's Krolik's best friend at the, the store, basically. Yeah, he just feels like the cool uncle to me. Yeah. You know, he just gives me those kinds of vibes. He's a really kind man who offers really funny jokes out of nowhere but then also really cares about you and gives great advice and he's just a cool guy um so yeah i mean i i liked this opening um i thought it was an interesting introduction to matichek because i don't know i feel like the film really painted him as something that i didn't necessarily see him as you know because you're saying he's kind of this overbearing boss i don't really see him that way he just seems like like a guy who doesn't have anything else to do. And so he's just kind of like, well, I guess I'm here all the time. <laughs> like he doesn't seem mean to me. Like if mm. I, I've worked with, I've worked for overbearing people before working for Mata check. I'd be like, cool. This is a breeze. Like, yeah, you might have input every once in a while, but you're not like the worst. Um, but I feel like the way people talked about him, it was like, oh, well maybe I should quit. I can't work under these circumstances. I'm like, dude, there's no way you could work at my job then because you'd you'd be running screaming. Um, but I don't know. I it, it was an interesting way that they introduced his character because mm-hmm. I, I kind mm-hmm. of liked him from the very... I don't think yeah. the movie says we're supposed to dislike him. Yeah, I don't think... The movie's not painting him as a monster or anything like no. that at all. The thing with him is like, which which I like because there's complexity there, is that he's not a bad guy. He actually can be very kind and generous It's just that he does have a very thin temper and he's very particular about things going his own way. He's very particular about people not making him look dumb. And these things, when he can be, when he is slighted or he feels slighted, he can fly off the handle and that can cause him to do impulsive things such as fire someone. And so Mm -hmm. everyone's kind of living on the edge of like, you know, if I'm on his good side, everything is fine. But if I step in the wrong direction and I push it too far, he might fire me and that would be mm-hmm. really bad. And so it causes this tension in, in the midst of everything that's going on, you know? Like, he, he, he cares about his employees, he definitely, but he can be a bit oblivious to the, the things that are going on underneath his toes and the way that his own kind of um, lack of consistency in the way that he treats them can cause conflict and can cause resentment and yeah tension like I said yeah yeah I I would agree with that I just I don't know I just feel like the movie wanted me to dislike him a little bit more than I did I was like no I I like him I like him 
Well, would I played- be pissed if he made me stay late to do window displays <laughs> when I had very important plans? Yes. Probably. But- yeah. He could have asked. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he's played by the Wizard of Oz, too. Another character who's like, you know, avuncular and we do like, but also. Oh, I don't like the Wizard of Oz. some problems. Not, oh, not like the him? movie, but the Wizard the, of the Oz. The Wizard himself. Yeah. I don't like him at all. Oh. I feel Honestly, like he's, it's been I feel like he's so mean. And he crushes he crushes her dreams. Aw. Anyway. <laughs> he's also the he's like the fortune teller at the beginning, right? In like the real world. Yes. Reading? It's been mm-hmm. so long since I've seen it. It's been movie. a long time since I've yeah. seen the movie. It's probably playing that. on TV right now. It because probably it's is. on during <laughs> Christmas time all the time. I feel like that's Wizard of Oz, that's one of those movies where it's like you watch it a billion times as a kid. And then you just never watch it again because you're like, oh, I just know this, you know, and it's so ingrained in the culture. But I'm like, man, there's probably a lot about that movie that I've forgotten (laughs) because I just haven't seen it in like 20 years. Yeah. Um, Okay. So, yeah. Also, the the, the dude who plays like the the private investigator in this movie, I was like, that's the lawyer guy from It's a Wonderful Life. (laughs) oh is it i didn't even yes. catch that oh my god i was gosh. like that's the dude who comes in and is like i'm collecting the money and he's like i don't have it and then at the end he walks up when they're all singing the song and he like rips up the the paper and puts a little money in the hat oh i was Maybe like you're Jimmy playing Stewart the same the character both times <laughs> yeah. you're on screen for like <laughs> he's a got a type and you say something important and then you go away <laughs> yep. he's got a type maybe jimmy stewart got him that role Shout out to that guy. Shout out to that guy. Whoever add, he is. Add him Great to job. the list of that guy movie actors that exist. So many. Um, okay. So um, so we learn Vada, Vadacek. Sorry. I'm like making up names at this point. Some of these names are really... Um, it's a lot of syllables. Um, so Krolik at this tells Pirovich about how... He reads him some of this letter that he just received. And he tells him about how... He's been carrying on this correspondence with an anonymous woman, and um, he's like, I wanted to improve myself, so I was looking to buy an encyclopedia, (laughs) which I'm like, it's a very direct way to go about improving yourself. Let me just read through the encyclopedia. (laughs) But yeah, he found this personal ad from a woman who wants to... uh, correspond anonymously on intellectual subjects and so they've they've been writing back and forth and Krolik is like he's over the moon about this girl he's like she's like no other girl I've ever met um, he's very impressed with the way that she expresses herself um, the then there's this thing that happens in the store where Matichek has like the option to buy this little musical cigar box and he 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 wants to buy it but he asks Krolik for his opinion and Krolik is like no and Matichek it's a very is, valid concern. Yeah, he gives Krolik. Here's the thing: Krolik is really good at his job. <laughs> Krolik is like he looks at it for like two seconds and then immediately rattles off these really great reasons. He's like, no, 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 the workmanship is all shoddy, and also the idea of a musical cigar box is bad <laughs> because it's gonna the music is gonna start to drive people crazy and they're not gonna like it. And Matichek is all like offended because Krolik is giving reasonable counter arguments to his own um idea um but then um this woman comes into the shop so this is clara novak and she's kind of like awkward and not really saying what she wants and Krolik is like giving her the whole sales pitch because he's trying to (laughs) here let me show you this bag we have all types of bags like we've got them in leather we've got them in calfskin we got them in blah blah blah. and she's like uh do you have a job (laughs) and Krolik is like oh gosh why'd you make me go through the whole thing (laughs) yeah which is so funny um yeah so Krolik is trying to tell Miss Novak, like, no, we don't have any positions open. And she's like, well, let me talk to the man, to the, you know, Mr. Matichek, the owner. And Krolik is like, no, 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 no. I've worked for Matichek for years. I know exactly what he's going to say. And of course, at that moment, Matichek comes up behind him and is like, oh, you know what I'm going to say, right? And then exactly what Krolik thinks is going to happen happens, which is he gets really upset when Miss Novak asks for him for a job. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) Um, let me see. Um, oh, I but did, then the... I don't know if I said this before. Yeah. I did find this movie very funny because you, you were saying there weren't very many laugh out loud moments for you. I did laugh out loud watching this movie, which is part of the reason why I really liked it. I, 
th- there were just these random jokes that came from out of nowhere that I thought were really witty and I really enjoyed them. So I, I found this, this movie to be very funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I found it weirdly less funny just on this watch. And I think it was because I was vibing more with the like, you know, experiencing working in an office with a lot of tension. Um, but in general, I, I do think this movie is very funny. The whole throughout the sequence, there's like this recurring joke where Matichek is like, he keeps asking people their opinion. He's like, I just want your honest opinion. And then Pirovich like keeps almost coming into the room and then running away and hiding because he yep. doesn't want to give his opinion. <laughs> yep. Which is pretty funny. Um, yeah. So um, the cigar box the musical cigar box that Krolik has just rejected actually comes back into play because Clara she picks it up and Matichek asks for her opinion and her her opinion is very different from Krolik she's like I think it's great but it's all based on vibes like it's romantic it makes me think of cigarettes and music um but then this woman comes into the store and Clara immediately is able to turn on the the salesman acumen and she the woman's like, oh, is it a candy box? And she's like, yep, it's a candy box. And she gives her this whole really clever pitch about how the music is, you know, it's not a negative. It's actually a pro because it makes you candy conscious. And so, you know, we all eat a little more candy than we mean to. But if the music plays every single time, it makes us less inclined to eat candy. And she manages to make a sale for like more than Matichek was asking for the box. So, um, yeah, she's a really talented uh, saleswoman. Um, yeah, thoughts on this whole section of the movie and the introduction of Clara? Well, I think I think I'm just gonna say that this is this is kind of where my complaints, if they are valid complaints, they might be invalid if I were to watch the movie again. But this is kind of where my complaints start a little bit in the sense that I feel like there are ideas that are presented and then they're kind of just like not fully developed and then we jump to something else it's like oh okay so clearly time has passed I guess or something yeah, you can very much happened that I didn't see like you I can know? feel like you can very much tell that this started as a play because I feel like in plays you can suddenly kind of have those abrupt time cuts and people mm-hmm. will just refer back to things that happened off screen whereas it's a little bit more awkward when it's on on film yeah there's just a lot of jumps forward in time that I was like okay cool or ideas that were presented and then all of a sudden it's like oh okay I guess it happened but we didn't see it happen and so correct me if I'm wrong because again I need to watch this movie again but I feel like she does she gives this sale and we never actually see her get hired but then all of a sudden she's hired like she's working there yeah we cut to like I don't know, six months later and yeah. she's been working there. Yeah. And I wasn't even aware that it was six months later until someone like directly said it a few minutes into being six months. Later. And I was like, okay, so what? Okay. I guess she's working there now. Cool. <laughs> I did really enjoy the fact that when they do the cut, um, the only real indicator that a lot of time has passed is like they had mentioned they were doing a summer sale and now all of a sudden it's snowing. So you can tell like at least a few months have passed, but in the window, <laughs> All, there's like this huge display of the cigarette boxes and they're like deeply discounted. So it's like Clara sold one. Mr. Matichek bought like five dozen and they have been not, not able to sell any of them since. Well, isn't there like an actual moment when some lady comes up and she's like, oh, kind of interesting. How much is it? And then someone tells her the price and she's like, no way. Oh, That's no, no, way no. Too expensive. <laughs> that really cracked me up. The, so this woman like walks up to the shop window she like doesn't even come inside she like knocks on the door and makes mr crawley come out but crawley comes out and she's like how much is that belt the one that says 295 and he goes uh 295 and she goes oh no <laughs> <laughs> which i feel like i've had so many interactions with people like that in my in my time at work yeah yeah Um, Okay. Yeah. So yes, as we mentioned, there is a time jump. Six months later, Clara has been working at the job for a while. And oh, I also thought the introduction to Peppy was kind of weird. It just again felt like something where I was like, okay, am I supposed to know who you are? Like, what? I don't know. It was just I didn't really understand who he was until later on. I was like, oh, you're the air okay cool that was not told to me at all but okay because i was like oh you work here but you were just here for five seconds and i don't see you anymore so you 
don't work here? Are you are you are you Matichek's son? Like, who are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially because, as we've said, he doesn't really look that much younger than most right. the other people who work there. <laughs> yeah, Pepe is that he's kind of the most comedic character. Um, I enjoy him, although I, I feel like I've seen some reviews that are like, Pepe is really annoying. Uh, hmm. I think he's kind of funny, though. I don't um, think his annoying. like his whole thing is he kind of has it in for Mrs. Modicek because Mrs. Modicek is basically using him as her own personal errand boy and is sending him all over town doing things for her. And even though we never see Mrs. Modicek, Peppy just has this kind of one sided feud um, with her that is finally resolved in a very satisfying way. Um, yeah, I love Peppy. So yeah, so we jump forward um, six months in the future as we're catching up with the characters. We learn that. Um, first, Mr. Modicek has been really distant with Krolik. Like, there's something weird going on there, and Krolik doesn't know what he is. He stopped inviting him over, he's kind of been picking fights with him, he's really been on the edge. And Krolik is really concerned because he's like, I really want to ask for a raise because I'm thinking I might want to get married, and I need Mr. Modicek to be in a good mood or else he's not going to give me this raise. And Can I just say, this mm-hmm. was another thing, sorry, I'm going to keep coming back to this because this yeah, was sure. like my main complaint with the movie, just kind of like the weird time jumps in the pacings and I felt like like the holes in the story progression where I was like, you're telling me that something is, ha- is happening, but I didn't, I'm not, you're telling me that something has happened, but I haven't seen it. And also this idea of like, I wanted more romance. I feel like the romance was kind of tacked on to this other story. What is What does this movie want to be? I'm confused. Because we're introduced to this idea in the beginning that, hey, I'm receiving letters from this person. She says cool things. Sick. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's I'm like... just imagining Jimmy Stewart saying, sick. 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 Um, but... <laughs> wow. Um, but, but so now we're jumping forward in time, which I don't even know if I was aware that we were jumping forward in time. Cause they're talking about like, Oh, he has been treating me poorly. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He was just fine yesterday. Like, I don't understand. And then he's talking about wanting to get married. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, I'm so confused. And I just, I feel like there were moments in this movie, particularly on the romance side of things, where I was like, oh, that's really sweet and that's really cute. But I also was like, but but, but where, where is the relationship? Like, I'm just getting individual moments, but I, I, don't, I don't feel like I've spent enough time with you to really feel invested in and connected to this relationship. So all of a sudden he's talking about wanting to get married and I'm like, why? Like, to who? What's ha- like, I don't, wh- why do you want to marry this person? I-, I didn't see anything that's happened over the last six months. You've just gone from, oh, cool lady to I'm getting married. And it just felt very abrupt to me. And like, it wasn't developed in the way that I wanted it to be. But again, that's one of those things where I'm like, maybe I need to watch it again because, you know, if this was a full-on romance, I'd be like, I, I hate this. What are you doing? Like, this is very poorly structured. Why are you telling a romantic story and leaving out six months of their relationship developing? That doesn't make sense to me. But maybe that's not what this movie is trying to do. But then why have it in there at all? Like, I don't... It's just... It's it's confusing to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is something that I feel like I've noticed in quite a few old movies, which I wonder if it's just kind of left over from theatrical playwriting and and story structure, you know, and that sort of developed differently as film as an art form um, became, you know, grew older and older and, and developed more and more, is that there are often things that are left unshown and then part of the story is filling in through, backfilling what happened through dialogue or telling you something and then kind of developing it from there but you kind of have to be on board with the story first telling you something if that makes sense um so yeah yeah i i can definitely see that it you know i've i've seen this movie so many times that i've kind of mentally constructed all of the something to fill all of the gaps but i, I remember being kind of thrown by that the first time i saw it being like oh wait hang on 6 months just passed and now all of a sudden crawlick and clara are fighting and um Krolik is on the outs with Mr. Modicek and what just happened and yeah I definitely see that um 
But yeah, speaking of which, so we learn that Krolik and Clara have now this sort of ongoing squabble that's been happening. They're constantly- Which again, we never saw. I was like, wait, so you guys don't... There was just so much. I was like, w- I don't I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, was I looking at my phone? But then I was like, but I didn't look at my phone while watching no, this no. movie. I was like, wait, <laughs> no. What, what's just, happening? We're we're picking up six months later, and this is the situation that they're they're in now. So they've been yeah. working together for a while, but he's constantly having to tell her, you know, don't do it this way, do it this way. You know, sometimes because it's not him, it's Mr. Modicek. Like in particular, they're fighting about this blouse that she wore, and Mr. Modicek didn't like it, and so he told Krolik to tell her not to wear it again and she gets all offended and he's like don't blame me i don't care what you wear it's mr (laughs) monacek but she kind of puts all the blame on him and she thinks he's just too controlling and overbearing and yeah so they keep sniping at each other um there is (laughs) we also learn that vadash is like clearly seeing some wealthy lady who keeps giving him expensive presents and he's just like going around begging for people to ask him about it and no one wants to ask him about it they're all like we do not care about you and what you do with your time and this Um, is being juxtaposed with i think they're establishing at this point that mrs modicek keeps calling mr modicek for more money and he's like i just that that's a lot of money like yeah okay which i think is is really i i don't know i feel like i feel like you know, in this time period, men were very much so in charge of the finances and blah, 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 and whatever. But I don't know. I kind of feel like the way that Matichek gives her money feels like he is very respectful of her. And the fact that, you know, he's not he's not nagging her about like, why are you asking me for more money? He's not questioning her. He's just kind of like, OK, you know, I I trust you like that. That's a lot of money. But if you say that you need it, I guess I'll send it to you, you know? And, and he seems like this, this genuinely good, good guy who's wanting to like take care of his wife well. And so kind of getting this, this, this hinting at this moment that there might be, I didn't pick up on it when I was watching it the first time, but now thinking about it, I'm like, I think that's a cool way to kind of introduce the dynamic that is, that is happening that we are soon to learn about in very specific ways. Yeah. Yeah. Like so much of this movie is kind of a mystery. It's like, why is Mr. Matichek acting in this particular way specifically toward Krolik? Because we learn Matichek is having issues with his wife. And I really love that scene on the phone that you just talked about for the way that he speaks to her because it is so different from the way that he is as a boss and the way he speaks to his employees he's very like what's the word he's kind of like uh not consoling but like trying to smooth things out trying to de-escalate trying to just placating i guess you know um and he's very like you said he's very respectful and he's very um like you know you get the sense that he really adores her and he really does not want to believe his suspicions are correct and he really would do anything you know if his suspicions are not correct he would do anything to keep her and um yeah so she asked for all this money and he's like okay i'll if you need it you i'll I'll wire it over like i'll I'll send it over that's that's fine um you know he's not pressing her for reasons for why she's going out all the time and why she's spending all this money he's just like all right i'm gonna give you what you need um, and we're but it's, also we're also mm-hmm. learning at this time, or maybe it had already been established, but I feel like we're learning that his his shop is not doing well. Like it's not a very profitable shop, and that's also another layer of stress on him. Of like, I want to give this to my wife, but also I don't really have much because sales aren't really going well. Like, look at our Christmas <laughs> display; it's really yeah. shitty. Like, <laughs> We got to spruce yeah. things up in here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, Matichek sees the, the window and he's like, yeah, this looks terrible. We need to redecorate it and we to do, need to do it tonight, which upsets both Krolik and Clara because both of them have a date that night. They have to an meet. engagement. As we learn one after the other, they're meeting there. Well, actually, we don't really know 
what's going on with Clara until Krolik knows it, which is kind of cool. We just know that Krolik is going to be meeting his anonymous pen pal. And so he's really excited and nervous. He's like, this is the girl that I'm head over heels for. And I think I want to ask her to marry me. Um, and now I have to stay late and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it. And Krolik is, uh, again, like, Matichek keeps being kind of antagonistic toward him. And Krolik is trying to ask for a raise and Mr. Matichek keeps brushing him off. And there's a, a little moment where Pirovich tells him, like, you need to be careful and not do anything rash if you want to get married. Um, he's like, you know, I'm I'm married and Krolik, or Matichek pushes me around all the time. He calls me an idiot. idiot. I'm not an idiot, <laughs> but I have a family to support. So I just say, yes, Mr. Matichek, no, Mr. Matichek, and I just go with the flow, you know? Um, like I said, the cool uncle. He's so cool. He's the best. He really is. Um, let's see. Clara, like, just, you know, because she wants to get out of having to decorate the window. She's like trying to butter up Mr. Krolik. And he's like, oh, you're such a gentleman. And uh, I can learn so much from you. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, keep this attitude up. And then she's like, can I have time off? And he's like, oh, that's what that was about. Um, but there's a little moment actually in there, which... I mean, this is this is just like two tiny little details. I don't know how much they were thought about, but, you know, for me, they kind of stuck out, which is when Clara first comes into the shop and is asking for a job, Krolik asks her, like she mentions that she's been at this other really prestigious, you know, really, really well-respected shops. And he's like, they would take me back in a minute if I asked them to. And Krolik asks her, well, why don't, why don't you just go back there and get your old job back? And she's like, well, that's my business. And we never really learn what she means by that. But in this scene, she mentions that some of the employers she's worked for have been really handsy and have tried to take advantage of the women who are under their employ. And so I feel like there's just maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I feel like there's that kind of subtext of like being a young, attractive, single woman in any workplace. You know, there's there's always vulnerability there. And so finding a space where you feel safe and you feel comfortable with the people that you work for is important and it's not always possible for everyone and so i feel like yeah again maybe i'm reading this into it but i feel like that's kind of going into where clara is coming from throughout this um this film it's like part of her backstory may have been working in a situation where she was um you know maybe treated not not well and she's trying to escape that and trying to find a better situation so yeah i don't know if you picked up on that at all i might be reading too much into it but anyway um i think i was too confused to pick up on that (laughs) yeah (laughs) no worries um do we also get introduced here to um the the storyline where krolik kind of is basically saying you know i'm considering quitting because you know, whatever. And then I don't remember the exact order of how it happens, but doesn't he like tell Matichek that, hey, I might not stick around here because of how you've been treating me. And then is it like the next day or something that Matichek is like, it might not be a good fit? What's the order of that? I don't remember. Yeah, it's a little bit, it is kind of in this extended argument that happens where they kind of talk and then other things happen and then they come back and talk a bit more but it is all the same day so yeah Krolik has been saying okay. telling Pirovich like I don't know how it's much more I can put up with this day before they mm-hmm. go on the date correct it's all okay mm-hmm. gotcha gotcha yeah so Krolik is trying to, or Clara is trying to ask Mr. Matichek for the time off Matichek is like appealing to Krolik to tell her no and Krolik's like well actually I also want the time off Matichek gets mad and starts picking a fight with Krolik and then they Krolik is like you know I feel like you you keep coming after me I don't know why I don't know what I've done maybe this isn't working out and so they kind of leave it there for the moment but then that night as they are staying late to redecorate the window is when Matichek calls Krolik into his room his office and Krolik is like oh, poor guy right. he like he thinks when, that like that's mm-hmm. when Krolik starts talking about oh my gosh I'm supposed to go on this date with this woman but and she thinks I have this career and now yeah. I don't have a job yeah, okay. yeah so yeah, yeah. that night Matichek fires Krolik and you know he's he's not like mean about it he, he gives him, him a really severance. beautiful letter of recommendation well actually that's kind of interesting that you say that because my interpretation of that letter was that it's 
it's positive, but it's very generic. You know, it's kind what? of very spare. I read it as being like interesting. Well, because. And, and, you know, at this time, what we don't realize, but Matichek thinks that Krolik might be going behind his back with his wife. So my interpretation of it is that Krolik is kind of dumbfounded about, like, I've put so much time into working for this man, and I thought we had a real rapport. And now he's given, let me go, and given me this letter that is like, it's a fine letter, but there's nothing personal about it, you know? It's just kind of stating the facts. That's but, not how I read it at all, but that's okay. Yeah, well, I kind I, of interpreted it as mm -hmm. similar to um, uh, Miranda's letter for Andy in uh, oh, at the yeah, end of yeah. Deborah's Prada, mm -hmm. where it's like, if you don't hire it's me, great... or, then you're an idiot, sort of thing. I don't know. It felt it felt very touching and and personal to me because he was like, he's worked here for this many years since he was a young lad, and I've seen him grow and he's the best I've had and da, da, da. I don't know. It felt very personal mm, to me, yeah. but why well, should we watch that scene? Like I, I said, I really liked Matichek in this movie. I mm -hmm. felt like he was a very, um, he just seemed like someone who sees the good in everybody and wants to see the good in everybody, regardless of like the reality of what might be going on. He wants to hope that, that that might not be true or whatever. And so the way that he, interacted with his wife given his suspicions but he still was like no no no. but I'm gonna assume the best I felt like the same to me here where he's like I'm mad at you because I think that this is what you're doing but at the same time I hope that it that you're not the one doing this and so I want to like write you this letter because I still feel loyalty and love towards you but I don't I mean yeah no whatever. I I that <laughs> interpretation never occurred to me but I do really like that reading I'll have to watch it again with that in mind and see if I, I feel differently. The way I've always interpreted it is it's a um, positive but very like personality-less letter. It's kind of the letter that you would give to someone who, you know, only worked for you for three months and you had a good experience of it, barely know, and Krolik feels let down by it. Um, but I should, yeah, I should watch it again and, and see if maybe I... Um, and more inclined toward your interpretation now. Um, anyway, yeah. So yeah. So Krolik has been fired, <laughs> and everyone yeah, like shakes you said, his hand and is like, mm -hmm. it's, it's this. Really everyone is so sad. There's they all thing, really like Krolik, apart from Clara. There's this thing that I really related to because for me in the film industry, like you're basically getting fired and or quitting every few months because you work on a production for, you know, all day, every day for months at a time. And then the production's over and then you go on to something else. And there is this sense of, you know, you get really close with people. And then whenever that job ends, you're very aware that like, really the only context in which I see you is when we're at work. And so if we're no longer at this job together, like we no longer have any relations sort of thing. And sometimes that can be a huge blessing because it's like, I don't have to talk to you anymore. But other times it can be like, oh, that kind of sucks because I do like you as a person, but also like We're I have my own life and I'm yeah. not going to see you outside <laughs> yeah. of this place. And so I felt that here, particularly between Pirovich and Krolik, this sense of like, you know, I, I really like you you're my friend, but also it's kind of that, that concept of like, you're my, my work wife or my work best friend or, or whatever it might be. It's like, yeah, we're, we're work besties, but you know, if you're fired, this is the end, you know? And I thought that that was, you know, on the one hand it was sad, but it also felt really like kind of sweet too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and the thing that I really love about the relationship between Krolik and Pirovich is, unlike everyone else in the office, I actually do get a sense that they hang out outside of work. And, like, that night, Pirovich goes over to see Krolik because he's like, I know he's going to be really feeling really low, and so I want to be there to support him. And so there is this sense that, I mean, we don't know, like you say, they, they both have their own lives, Pirovich especially, but there is a sense that maybe that friendship could continue even if Krolik wasn't working there anymore. Um, yeah, so uh, Krolik was not intending to, like, keep his, you know, he, he's like, I can't go and propose marriage to this girl if I don't have a job. <laughs> but he still wants to go there and, like, you know, 
make sure that See she what showed she up. what looks like. Yeah, I think he's got like a note he was going to send to the waiter, so it's not like he stood her up. Um, but he, Pirovich goes with him. You got that great exchange, which is basically replicated almost completely exactly. And you've got mail where he's like, Pirovich looks at her and he's like, you know, she, yeah, she's very pretty. Um, you know, she she's got a little bit of the coloring of Clara Novak, and Krolik's like, yeah, well, okay, fine. Why would you bring up Clara Novak? And he's like, well, if you don't like Clara Novak, you're not gonna like this girl. Why? Well, why because not? it is Clara Novak. Because it is Clara Novak, <laughs> <laughs> which is always great. I love how too, like Krolik keeps insisting, like, no, 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 no. We, you know, we like each other on a higher intellectual plane. I don't care about looks. Like she, I don't care if she's beautiful or not. And once Pirovich tells her he's she's pretty, he's like. Like, yes um but yeah so, people say that it's a lie yeah it's i don't yeah. care who you are you're lying yeah um but yeah Kralik is like flabbergasted <laughs> understandably um he at first was like kind of intending to just walk out and not do anything but then he does He's well like, actually i'm this intrigued yeah, yeah. So he goes in and, um, you know, <laughs> there's this great scene where, like, you know, because they have a range to, I think, which is the same in You've Got Mail, um, they're going to identify each other with, like, a flower. Like, Clara puts it in a book and he's supposed to wear it on his lapel. And this waiter comes up and is telling her all these stories about how, yeah, oh, yeah, we, like, get people all the time doing that. Like, we had a really great one last week, but then we had a bad one last the, the week before where the guy took one look at the girl and went away and, like, oh, don't worry about it, though. She's, like, getting so stressed out. It's like, oh, my gosh, is he going to show up? Um, but yeah, so Kralik comes in, and of course she doesn't realize that he's her pen pal, and so immediately starts sniping at him, and he's sniping at her. There's that whole exchange that we quoted at the beginning, where she's like, I would find in you like a cigarette lighter that doesn't work, and he's like, oh wow, that's beautifully expressed, and also- But also very mean. <laughs> very mean. <laughs> um she like men he mentions that there's been this rumor going around that he's bow-legged and he's really offended about he tells her that she's going to be an old maid and she calls him a little insignificant clerk which you can tell really hits home for him like he he really feels that can i just say i really this was a particular moment where i was like i really wish that i had seen more of their relationship over the last six months both on a romantic level in terms of writing the letters back and forth, but also as co-workers of how they dislike each other. Because I feel like this moment would have carried so much more weight in the sense of like, I'm really seeing the conflict here between they really have this beautiful, deep connection on this one side of things. But on the other side of things, they hate each other. And so because of that, these are like these two really like, interesting just an interesting paradox to be trying to you know figure out and how are they going to come together yeah but because we have no basically no backstory to either of these dynamics other than here we are and here are the dynamics i it didn't it didn't i, I felt like i was trying to conjure up the emotions in the moment that i was supposed to be feeling but i wasn't actually feeling mm. them yeah well and Toward the end of the movie, actually, we get some backstory on what this dynamic is and why it developed. Um, the reason why they're they've been at each other's throats for so long, and that's but why I, I think... don't I don't want it to be backstory though. Well, like, no, I, I mean, want to I... see it happening. Yeah, I don't want it to be like let's talk about this thing that happened. It's like, well, I, I want to see it happen. Mm, so, okay. yeah, no, I understand. Like, like I said, I feel like part of that is the sort of old movie and more theatrical storytelling conventions versus more modern storytelling conventions um, is this idea like that we need to see things on screen as opposed to having things told to us or have as opposed to kind of having to wait for information to be doled out in these particular ways. And I think, again, this is why this movie does re reward rewatches because, yeah, there are a lot of things. I totally agree with you. I would love to see some scenes from those six months of their dynamic and what goes on but as you know as i've rewatched it many times over the years i can kind of fill in with my imagination oh i know this is why they have this dynamic the way that they do here's how it could have developed and then the important thing is we're picking up the story at the inflection point where it's going to 
start changing and morphing. But yeah, if anything, I, I don't disagree with you at all. If anything, this movie made me really want to rewatch You've Got Mail because I finished this movie and I was like, yeah, I mean, cute romance, but like it wasn't complete. There was a lot missing from this story. And I feel like if You've Got Mail does take the romantic side of this and kind of go all in on that, there's yeah, potential it goes that I would by like step. it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have seen that movie probably once on cable by chance when I was like 12. So I don't, maybe I would hate it. I don't know. Maybe we'll go too far into cheese town. I would be very curious to hear what you think of it. I mean, my sense is that you probably wouldn't like it, but I would be very curious. Even if you don't like it, I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. It, it, it could very easily be in cheese town for me, but you know, this movie made me want to rewatch this movie, but mm-hmm. also rewatch that movie. So yeah, I, I guess in that rewatch. sense, it's a win. <laughs> yeah. I definitely want to rewatch. You've got mail and you've got mail another, I mean, Nora Ephron, New York kind of fall to winter type movie. It's another movie that takes place over, um, quite a long period of time. Um, very when Harry met Sally vibes. So um, anyway, yeah, so they've been squabbling and they kind of just say really incredibly mean things to each other and then Krolik leaves. Um, but while all of this is happening also, which is very important, as everyone has left, Mr. Modicek back at the office gets this, um, this detective comes over and tells him like, you know, kind of explains to us Mr. Modicek had received this anonymous letter that told him one of his employees was sleeping with his wife. And he's like, yeah, I've been following your wife and I can confirm that it's true. But the employee that she's been sleeping with is Mr. Vadash, which is... Don't know what she sees in him, but that's No idea. (laughs) No idea whatsoever. Um, But yeah, clearly this information is really surprising to Mr. Modicek because he had thought that it was Krolik. And there's this really beautifully melancholy Which scene. Which honestly is like a compliment to Krolik because <laughs> it's kind of like he, he doesn't You're even so hot. Like I just yeah, assume that my wife would be. Yeah, he's you. like, what? What does she see in him? That yeah. guy? That yeah. guy? <laughs> By the way, have you ever heard the story about how on the set of um, the Philadelphia story, basically every single person in the cast, male and female alike, were all in love with Jimmy Stewart and trying to sleep with him? really <laughs> he's just so charismatic yeah that's so interesting with all the people in that movie jimmy stewart would not be the one out of that cast that i'd be like pining after but that's also because i'm me and i fucking love um Catherine hepburn, i was gonna but... say are you a Catherine hepburn stand? oh yes oh yes yeah even before i knew i i knew mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes she's great yeah um, um... Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So there's this really, I thought, beautifully melancholy little line from Matichek where he talks about how he and his wife, they've been married for 22 years. And he says, Mm -hmm. I guess she just didn't want to grow old with me. And it's, (laughs) he's such a good character. Yeah, he's a great character. There's so much complexity to him. Like, he's genuinely devastated by this. He, I think he genuinely really adored his wife and is so, he didn't want to believe it, but he had to know. And now he knows and he just yeah it it completely has shattered his world and um pepe arrives and mr matichek's like shut up in his office the detective has gone home and pepe's kind of like wandering around and he happens to look into matichek's office and we don't see it but we hear he's like no and there's a struggle and then this gun goes off and everyone's fine but mr matichek has had basically a breakdown and tried to shoot himself we see a a light bulb burst yeah that's right Yeah, like he shot the light bulb. But yeah, so Pepe has just barely managed to prevent him from committing suicide. Um, and then we jump forward in time and all of a sudden <laughs> everyone knows the dynamic of what, why he shot himself and all that. Well, well, first we have, like, um, I think it's later that night, uh, Krolik comes to the hospital. Like Pepe called him into the hospital and um, Matichek talks him over and he explains what happened. He's like, I'm so sorry for distrusting you, but, you know. I thought that you were sleeping my wife and I just the jealousy just completely took over um and Krolik is like why why did you think it was me and I don't remember Matichek's yeah answer to that question I think he says just like you were the only one who'd been to my home oh yeah 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 that's what it was Mm, yeah yeah 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, he's he asked Krolik if he'll come back and be the manager, and Krolik agrees. So now yeah, there's a nice little as Krolik is heading out the door, he's like, you know, now that you're manager, you can give yourself a raise. And Krolik's like, well, you know, I'll I'll talk His it over with face myself. Brightens and... up so much when he's, he's so told excited. That. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're right. <laughs> Ooh, the power. Um. So yeah, the next day, um, yeah, I guess everyone had been like phoned and told the news because they all are aware. They're all congratulating Krolik. Um, <laughs> Mr. Vadesh, you know, who's Krolik is fully intending to fire. Um, he's like, oh, yes, like, uh, I, you know, we're going to get along great. This is going to be fine. Anything I can do, boss, you know, you're the new boss and everything. And Krolik is like, all right, go into the stock room, take the really heavy suitcases at the bottom of the shelf and put them on the top shelf and take the really heavy suitcases from the top shelf and put them on the bottom shelf. And Vadesh is like, uh, yeah, sure. Great. Right away. Um... Yeah, so Pepe has like his little moment of triumph over Mr. Modicek because she calls and he's like, oh, I forgot to deliver that perfume bottle to you. Well, you're never going to get it. Ha ha ha. He basically tells her where to stick it. But that's um, what I mean by kind of, you know, again, something happening where we don't actually see it happening. I'm like, oh, okay. So clearly they know that she's cheating on him. I, like I never saw Pepe peppy get that information but apparently he knows so there oh we yeah go. well i assume like mr modicek had to tell peppy when it's like wait why did you right. just try to <laughs> but it's just another one of those things where it's like okay clearly information given off screen information given off screen and something's happening and i'm the one having to figure out like put the pieces together which not that i want to be spoon-fed plot like i I don't want a movie to spoon feed me plot. I, I like to have opportunities for me to kind of infer and, and, you know, have my own interpretations. But if it's like a critical part of the story, it's like you want to make sure that your audience knows, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I like the way the fact that he just he basically fully gives away everything that happened, because when Mr. Bo Mrs. Modicek calls, he's like, hey, why don't you go and talk to Mr. Vanish about it? And like all the employees are watching him do this. And he's like, draw your own conclusions. <laughs> yep. So yeah, basically spilling everyone the the business. Um, so Krolik, uh fires Vadish. Um, By pushing him into the like, musical cigar boxes. Yeah. And they all just yeah. start playing this song that in the beginning, everyone was mm -hmm. like, these boxes are dumb because this song is annoying. And you're going to yeah, hear it over and over. That apparently Mr. Matichek went and bought a million of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also like how... Like, again, I guess with the information happening that uh, we weren't privy to, but everyone is seems to not only be so excited about Mr. Vadish being fired, but already have, like, prepared absolutely everything for him. They're like, we've got your last month's, we got your severance pay in an envelope, we've got, you know, your coat and hat are, like, right here. Like, we are ready to shoo you out the door. <laughs> I will say... Again, another complaint kind of along similar lines is we have this introduction to this idea when Vadas is is kind of like, you can't do this. You'll be hearing from my lawyer. Da, da, da. And then nothing ever comes from that. We just never see him ever again. And nope. I was like, he's gone. I, I don't think he really has a lawyer. I don't know. I just feel like the way that he delivered that line made it seem like we're going to see him again. But then it was just like, nope, he's he's gone. I he's like, gone. Okay, I yeah. guess. <clears throat> um so while all this has been happening clara has hasn't been there because she you know she's been really devastated by the fact that she thinks she was stood up by her pen pal um she goes to the mailbox and like it's empty there's no letter and she comes into the office and she's not feeling well and then poor clara she like Krolik tells her like oh I'm I'm back and I'm the manager now and she's like oh stop joking with me this is too much bad news in one day and then he like answers the phone call and she just like completely passes out um but he like their dynamic is so much shifted like he is now even though it seemed like he was really mad when oh they wait parted. can I mm -hmm. oh, can go, I say go for it this was I don't know what this says about me but the moment in this movie that was the most romantic to me was when she walks in 
and she's just kind of like huffing and puffing and just like blah 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 and then the first thing he says is how are you i know and she's just like wait what he's, he's <laughs> like, concerned about me what's know? going and on then, and mm-hmm. then after that he kind of immediately goes into business talk but the mm-hmm. fact that he sees her and he's just like how are you <laughs> and she's taken aback by it that that was for me that was the most romantic part of the movie that yeah. part i was like whoo Yes. That's really sweet. Mm-hmm. This, yeah, this whole section of the part movie is where I just completely melt into a puddle every single time Jimmy Stewart is looking at Maureen Sullivan because he's just, he is so sweet and solicitous to her. And he's just, he's so like kind of gingerly walking around her, being like, how do I fix this? I know I want to fix this. I need to figure out how. And so I need to kind of. You know, it's you know like the trying way to, to do like, it, trick her even more. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's like, you know, it's like, I, I don't know, there's like a cat that keeps scratching you. And so you're trying to just kind of edge up as gently as possible and be like, see, I'm not a threat. And maybe we can like <laughs> form an understanding here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she she's like sick. She's at home in bed. He goes to visit her. Yeah, she's and- sick. Yeah. Well, she's sick, but she's like, my problem. I think she's it's heartbroken. Psychological. Is, is more yeah. So, yeah. And he's like, well, if it's psychological, maybe it'll heal more quickly. And she's like, you do not understand anything. We do not live on the same planet. She's so dramatic. I love it. So dramatic. Um, it's so cute the way like she will say something and he's like, that was really mean. But also the way you express that, you know, with like little heart eye- hearts in his eyes. And then he'll say something and she's like, oh, that's like a really nicely expressed thing. Like there's, now that their walls are coming down, they're actually starting to see in each other the things that they love in their letters. You know, they're actually starting to let these little glimpses of who they really are underneath out into the open because they're kind of, you know, seeing each other outside of work, outside of this high pressure situation. And and um, yeah, finally starting to interact as actual people. I do um, like the dynamic, too, of having the letters because I feel like I have very much so disliked this romantic trope in the past of like, oh, we hate each other. And then all of a sudden something flips and we're in. I'm like, I hate that. That's not how things happen in real life. And even if it does happen in real life, it's like, why are you going for the person that's mean to you instead of the person that's actually kind to you? Like, I, I hate that dynamic. I think it's annoying and I don't want movies to keep perpetuating that unhealthy and unrealistic dynamic but I do like it in this movie because I feel like this movie does communicate that if they had not communicated through letters not knowing who each each other was like in that way this never would have happened they would have stayed people in the workplace who like we're just snipping at each other and all of those things. But it's because of this other thing that he happened to discover that he's willing to push through to get to know her. So it's not like a, oh man, she's playing hard to get. It's more so like, okay, I, you know, she's not playing hard. She just doesn't like me and whatever. But like, I know that this could work because of this other information. So I'm going to push through and try and like, help her see that this is a connection that's already there basically yeah Yeah. well this is such a i I mean i think one of the reasons that the story is so evergreen and has been reinterpreted so many times is because it is very insightful about the way that human nature works and how we can see a person in one we can establish a relationship with a person in a certain circumstance that will set us against them or we could establish a relationship with that person in another circumstance that could draw us toward them and sometimes it's the circumstances that cause us to be at odds with each other rather than who we are deep down as human beings. And if there's a way to strip back those things that were keeping us apart, we could actually, you know, maybe given the circumstances, fall in love or even just, you know, form a friendship, like have a really meaningful connection with that person that is due to who we are as human beings, you know, due to our minds, our souls, our hearts, you know, rather than due to the circumstances. And which is one reason that like my own little like pet dream project is I would love to see this movie remade or at least 
not a direct remake, but, you know, like a, another interpretation of this story now that we're like 25, 30 years away from You've Got Mail, which, oh my gosh, we are all so old. Um, but I feel like there there could be room for a really clever, intelligent redoing of this story in the age of the internet where so many people have so many relationships and so many interactions every day that is purely through a screen and is purely we're seeing one side of the person which is what they choose to put on the internet but we are not seeing the whole person and this idea that maybe you can meet someone over the internet and meet someone in real life and they seem like they're two different people but there's a way to reconcile the two that you can actually um you know find a way to to really get to know them and appreciate them. I don't know. Geneva, I, I can't mm -hmm. I can't wait until the day, assuming this happens, I cannot wait until the day that you and I both find our people and we can reflect on what is the journey of how we actually got here? Because I feel like you and I both, you probably more so than me, but you and I both have these ideas of like what we would like that process to look like versus the reality of how that might actually play out i feel like that'll be a fun conversation if and when that day comes yeah could be our very own when harry met sally yeah i mean ugh, i don't even want to talk i i mean i've <laughs> talked about my relationship with when harry met sally right mm -hmm. yeah no yeah, we i did all upset on it no, but no but my relationship to like the concept of that movie oh um i assume you did but i can't remember off the top of my head now yeah i'm while. convinced that that is the movie that kept me straight for so long oh that's right yeah i do remember you talking aside about from like so many other dynamics <laughs> yeah. of like religion and culture and society well but in just, your like, case it would be oh a well these guys that i'm friends with like <laughs> someday something will change <laughs> It's like, I just in, have to wait it out. In your case, Never it would happened. be when Sally met Sally. Or when oh, Sally met Marie. Right. Exactly. Oh, anyway. Goodness. Anyway. Okay. Uh, where were we? Yes. They, so they're talking in the bedroom. Um, oh, there's this nice little moment where Krolik is like, he's kind of sowing the first seeds of doubt in his own alternate self by um like clara's reading the the letter the the newest letter from her pen pal like it arrives while Krolik is there and Krolik's like really excited to see her watch her read it and everything um and the pen pal is like oh yes i did i stood you up because i saw you were talking to that extremely attractive man <laughs> <laughs> which is really funny yeah um but yeah, like Ben Krolik is like, wait a second, this guy didn't want to just like come in. Like, what is he not a man? Like, what? Why is he not doing? <laughs> like, trying to kind of cut down his own pen pal persona. And Clara's like, no, 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 he's just sensitive. Like, you clearly wouldn't understand. You that. just wouldn't understand. Yes. Um, <laughs> Clara tells him that she really she's for Christmas she's gonna buy one of those cigarette boxes, <laughs> the musical cigarette boxes, and Krolik is like. <laughs> horrified by this <laughs> she's so mean i know oh man <clears throat> and she's so convinced that he's gonna love it too and Kralik's like all right well i guess it is what it is um okay so christmas eve has now arrived um the they're all gearing up for um the christmas eve rush which will hopefully you know be a good sale and make the store be on solid ground um uh let's see what what happens so yeah it's just like you know it's a really busy sale and mr modicek comes back and he's like watching from the outside and he's all you know he's he's doing a lot better he's really happy to see how well the shop is bustling around there's a really funny moment where he like he tries, tries to, to sell something and they're like well you would know, Mr. Modicek. Like he, like, he tries to scam this customer into going into the store. He's like, oh, I can't see the prices without my glasses. Like, what is the price? And she gives it to him. And he's like, oh, man, that's such a good price. How does Modicek and company do it? And she's like, well, seeing as you're Mr. Modicek, if you don't know, I don't know who would. <laughs> yep. Very great. Um, but yeah, so they, they have a really great Christmas sale. And um, Modicek gives all the employees the speech he thanks them for their work he kind of has this moment where he's like this store is my home like this is the place where i spend most of my life like it's kind of 
<laughs> super I love depressing. his character so much. Yeah, it's kind of like sweet, but also really depressing. Because it makes he's like, me think about life in a way that I don't want to think about it. Mm-hmm. Like, how much of my life do I spend <laughs> at work working that I could be spending doing something else? Or how mm. much time do I spend stressing about how I need to work? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, he gives up bonuses to everyone, and so there's a new errand boy that Pepe has hired called Rudy. <laughs> and check gives Rudy some cash, and then Pepe like he kind of looks at it, and then he's like, "Too much." <laughs> like Pepe, and like I'm a clerk now. I've been promoted. I'm an adult, and he's trying to act all like um grown up and and stern. It's just very funny to me. Um, <clears throat> so everyone's kind of breaking up to go home for dinner. And Matichek, and this is the part of the movie that this really is the hits sweetest part of the whole mm-hmm. movie. I don't even know if it's sweet. It's like I don't know. It's really sad. Honestly, it is. it's very like, bittersweet. It, I don't know. I feel like to me, it really hit hard because I've been Mr. Matichek many times, where it's been like, you know, something significant is happening, and I don't want to spend it by myself, but I also don't want to like force myself on other people and so I kind of drop little hints and people like oh yeah my life's great and I'm like awesome um hello (laughs) yeah (laughs) it was that classic like this is what it's like to be a single person away from family over a holiday where everyone it seems like everyone else in your life has plans and you don't and so you're trying to figure out if you can kind of insinuate yourself into someone else's plans or should I just make time being by myself how do I make it special is there someone that I can reach out to and yeah it's like it's kind of lonely and kind of sad but also very sweet so he's um he starts he tries to invite Krolik to Christmas dinner but Krolik's like oh I've got plans already and he's like no 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 no, don't worry about it don't worry about it I just I just wanted to make sure that you had plans which is very sweet yeah um and he's kind of asking the other employees about their plans. And they're like, oh, yeah, my family's coming over. I've, you know, I'm going to go see my, my girlfriend. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Um, but finally, he talks to Rudy, the new little errand boy who's just a teenager. And he learns that Rudy is all alone in the city. His, his family don't actually live in Budapest. And so he's like, Rudy would you like to come home with me and we will get like a huge goose and we'll get some apple pie and we're going to get some, you know, all the stuffing and all the trimmings and everything. And little Rudy's like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. And it's just so sweet. The two of them, like kind of, you know, being alone in this city and being able to have this little connection with each other. Yeah. I I thought it was really cute how you know, Matichek would say one thing and then for Rudy, that was like enough. So he was like, yeah, yeah, of course. And then he says something else and he's like, oh my gosh, yes. And then he keeps going and going. He's like, of course I'm coming over. It's yeah. really sweet. It's I, so sweet. Honestly, that was the happy ending I wanted. If the movie had just ended right there, I would have been like, okay, mm-hmm. we're good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, so... um. Everyone else has gone home. Clara is wrapping up her present, which <laughs> Pirovich managed to wheedle things around so that she's going to give uh, her pen pal a wallet rather than uh, the musical cigarette box. Pirovich being such a good friend to Krolik. Um But yeah, so she's she's wrapping that up. Krolik shows her like, oh, I got this necklace for my girlfriend. Why don't you try it on? I want to see it, what it looks like on a woman. Um, honestly, that necklace is kind of ugly, but. Oh, it's really ugly. Yeah. Glad I'm not alone in that. And isn't there a part where she's like, are those diamonds? I'm like, I didn't see any diamonds in there, babe. (laughs) Like, that just looks like something plastic that was spray painted Mm -hmm. to kind of look like metal. (laughs) She goes, are those real diamonds? And he goes, pretty near. And I'm like, wait, are they or aren't they? (laughs) No, that means no. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But anyway, yeah. So they're, it's like, you know, they're friendly toward each other now and they start talking like you know kind of getting into real stuff and clara admits that when she started first started working at the shop six plus months ago she actually developed a big crush on him and she tried to get him to notice her but her method of trying to get him to notice her was to basically just treat him really poorly and of course that backfired and then basically led to the situation that they've been in the last six months where they're just constantly fighting 
and um Krolik st- <laughs> is really funny. Krolik is like telling Clara um well, you know, you're going to get engaged now and oh by the way, you're in fiance came to see me the other day and so What's i his met him name? and i talked like, to him like like club leg or something <laughs> he's like his name oh yes yeah, soon you're gonna be mrs popkin and she's like popkin yes of course and you're like you, she's so trying to act like she's excited to hear this and she's like horrified and he's telling her like oh yeah you know he's kind of old and he's losing his hair but you know he's just like a solid mature citizen yeah he's out of work but you know when i told her told him how much you make like he wasn't he was a little bit happier and she's like she's so devastated by all of this and then he's like oh yeah you know all those beautiful like words that he's been writing to you yeah they're all quotations he stole all of those and she's just like absolutely shattered she's so upset um i do like though how it pointed out again like a lot of times my complaint with stories like this can be you don't you've never seen this person Mm -hmm. you don't actually like how much can you fall in love with like you know it could all be a lie And I liked how this movie kind of pointed that out of like, hey, you actually don't know this person at all. And you probably should think a little bit more about this before you jump into marrying this person. Um, And I liked that this movie pointed that out. Um, I also, it made me, you know, when he made up the the name of, you know, this fake guy or whatever. Matthias Popkin. (laughs) Yeah, it made me think of um, the first A Star Is Born, like Esther Blodgett. Oh my (laughs) god! They're like, we need to change that name. (laughs) There's just Uh certain names that you hear them, you're like, yeah, that that, that name's... There's a particular type of person that you affiliate with, like, that type of name. Um, You know, obviously, there's, there's some dated things here in terms of, like, oh, we're talking about his size and you know because he's not thin that means he doesn't look good or or because I, you know I, I I did think it was funny though that idea not that women can't be you know the, the breadwinners for the family but this idea that he was like oh I can just coast like on that's my fine. Wife's salary. Like, yeah. I'll just live off of her money I guess yeah. <laughs> and she's like that is not what not I okay. signed up for yeah <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. This whole section or this idea in You've Got Mail is really expanded to a whole section of the movie. Like Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, there's a a large period of time, not a large, I should say, but, you know, it's like kind of a montage of scenes in which they're going out and doing stuff together and they're talking about, you know, who Tom Hanks's email persona, which Meg Ryan does not realize is Tom Hanks. Um, But he's kind of like, gently poking it down and being like yeah well you know what what is his handle like you know what does this mean like maybe he's in prison he was in prison like maybe he's like maybe he's in the mafia like just trying to kind of gently push her away to this you know really idealized picture that she's built which is the same for clara you know there's this really idealized picture that she's built of who this person is to no actually that person can't possibly be real but there is a real person in front of you who is that, but is also more, and who really loves you. And you just need to, you know, kind of get to a place emotionally where you can give that a chance. Can I say something that mm -hmm. might potentially make you not want to be friends with me anymore? (laughs) Oh, boy. Go for it. I I didn't really like this last scene. I didn't... I, I, I wasn't particularly entertained by this idea of like oh I'm gonna beat around the bush and I was like just tell her like why are we going through all of this like I get it that's kind of the gimmick that's the romantic part of like this this is this is probably what people like you know people are watching it's like oh my gosh how sweet how clever how witty but I'm like why do we need all of this just tell her (laughs) like just tell her I'm so bored like this is taking too long you know I'm like why are you playing these mind games just tell her who you are tell her how you feel and it can be done like this is annoying do you think it would have worked as well though if he had just straight up told her by the way that guy you've been writing letters to is me 
Well, I mean, I, I he wouldn't have to say it directly like that. I feel like it could have been written in a way that's romantic and poetic without beating around the bush so much. Like, like he could have written her a letter that was like, hey, it's like the final letter in the mailbox. And he's standing there while she he's like, oh, I found this letter in the mailbox from this guy. A final letter. Like, have we seen that in other movies before? Yes, we have. But <laughs> but at least it's more straight to the point. <laughs> oh, man, I disagree with this criticism, but also it's so on brand for Tina and I love it. <laughs> it it really is. I mean, I, I just like I, I don't have patience for this. Yeah, do you like, feel no, it or I don't do got, you not I don't have any it? time for like, this. What's do you like here? me? Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, then don't waste my time. Exactly. If you do, then don't waste my time. <laughs> I will say though, I will mm-hmm. say though, I did and this is not a knock against this movie at all. I just think that some movies are a lot more interested in like, you know, the the cinematography presentation of stories and this movie does not seem to prioritize that as much it's more so like hey let's have the camera here to capture whatever yeah, it's and, more functional know. yeah a lot of it is it's honestly a lot of wide shots there aren't many like close-ups it's it, the camera's very wide um but I will say there was one shot in this movie that I really found beautiful which is the one when he pulls his pants up and they're, which out of context this whole thing of like oh i'll pull up my pants is super creepy uh-huh. and weird yeah. but in context it makes sense so there's a rumor going around that Kralik is bow-legged and he's really like no i'm not like i will pull up my pants and like show you my legs many times <laughs> many times he's like you want me to pull up my pants yeah. like please don't do that um but but that shot at the end mm-hmm. of both of their feet on the floor facing yeah. each other when he pulls his pants up i i did really like that shot mm-hmm. i thought it was beautiful yeah. And there's that gorgeous shot too where so, you know, I should say so after completely <laughs> puncturing her eye vision of who who this um letter writer is, uh Krolik admits like he he basically is like, I really wish it could be me. I wish we could be together and she's like, No, no, no and then he starts quoting from the letters and then she realizes, Oh, it is you and she takes a minute and there's this really beautiful shot of her face as she's kind of like going through all of these emotions. And he's like, how do you feel? And she's like, psychologically, I'm very mixed up. But personally, I feel fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then he, she asked him to like, she's like, before, before we do this, can you please prove to me once and for all that you're not bow-legged? And he's like, okay. So he pulls up his pants and he's not bow-legged. Um, and then they kiss and then that's the end. So... <clears throat> when they kissed i gave an exasperated sigh <laughs> i was like oh okay <laughs> all right we had to get to it it's it's very sweet we knew oh. it was coming but we knew it was coming yeah <clears throat> these these old movie kisses can just be so dramatic that i'm like all mm-hmm. right i know okay i always i mean maybe this is like you know my own childhood trauma from having grown up watching only almost exclusively old movies but i always thought they looked very romantic the way men would wrap their arms completely around the woman and then when I grew up and found out that that's not really how people kiss, I was like, oh, that seems less less exciting somehow. That would be horrifying. I'd be like, excuse me, you're really like, <laughs> yeah, like this is kind of aggressive. Calm down. This yeah. is our first kiss and you won't let me go. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Um, yeah. So that's uh, Chop Around the Corner. Um, <clears throat> I, need, I need to watch it again. Mm. I, I really, really would like to watch this movie again. Yeah, yeah. Please, please do. I mean, you know, give it some time, but like maybe could be a next Christmas uh, revisit. Yeah, I mean, it love to it genuinely thoughts. is like, like I said in the beginning, I really like all of these individual pieces a lot. I really love Matichek's story. I really love Krolik's kind of individual story. I, I like the romance. It's just kind of, they exist as these separate pieces in my mind. And I don't, really understand how they come together here and i feel like if i watch it again hopefully it would all of those things would come together and it's like they're not individually great together as one whole they are great i would i would really like to get to that point yeah <clears throat> all right well uh do you have any more thoughts on the the movie overall i think i've pretty much touched on everything from my my notes everything that i wanted to say i think so too yeah okay. Great. All right. So in terms of 
um, awards. So this movie was not nominated for any Oscars, um, although it has, you know, very much grown in estimation. As of now, um, Metacritic has it at 96. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 99%, which I'm like, who is the 1% <laughs> who wrote a uh, thumbs down review of Shop Around the Corner? Um, I found a couple of... I kind of couldn't decide which review I actually wanted to go for. And now let me look, because I've got like four, but I don't want to read that many. So let me. Yeah, I see. looked at this initially and I was like, wow, this is a lot of reviews and they're all quite long. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm just going to read two. So, first, this is Variety from 1939. So, right when the movie came out. Because um, it, it, the movie was a hit and it was also critically well reviewed. So it says, although the picture carries the indelible stamp of Ernst Lubitsch at his best in generating humor and humor, human interest from what might appear to be unimportant situations, it carries further to impress via the outstanding characterizations by Margaret Sullivan and James Stewart in the sparring spots. Sullivan's portrayal is light and fluffy in contrast to the seriousness of Stewart in both business and romance. I... Yeah, I like that, although I don't know that I would call her portrayal light and fluffy. She definitely is a more yeah, sort of... Yeah, I don't of, think she's light and fluffy either. Yeah, she's more like a... She's definitely a more sort of romantic, emotional um, character, but I don't think the performance is particularly fluffy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other one... So this is a quote that was like on the Wikipedia page for this movie. And I was like, I don't want to just pull something from Wikipedia. But then I was like, actually, I really like this quote. So I'm just going to read it. <laughs> so this is by a film critic named David Thompson. Um, he says, the shop around the corner is among the greatest of films. This is a love story about a couple too much in love with love to fall tidily into each other's arms. Although it all works out finally, a mystery is left, plus the fear of how easily good people can miss their chance. Chances. Beautifully written by Lubitsch's favorite writer, Samson Raphaelson, Shop Around the Corner is a treasury of hopes and anxieties based in the desperate faces of Stuart and Sullivan. It is a comedy so good it frightens us for them. The cafe conversation may be the best meeting in American film. The shot of Sullivan's gloved hand and her ruined face, searching an empty mailbox for a letter, is one of the most fragile moments in film. For an instant, the ravishing Sullivan looks old and ill, touched by loss. Hmm. Um, yeah, I... Just like how that gets at kind of the, like he says, the hopes and anxieties and the, the kind of edge of desperation and kind of moments of fragility and potential loss that are in this film, which is, again, one of the things that I think elevates it from just being kind of a, a comedy with nothing to say to something that's a little bit deeper. Um, yeah, so overall, I love this movie. I was really happy to revisit it. Um, honestly, the thing that has always stuck with me Apart from the romance, I mean, I love everything to do with the romance. I, again, <laughs> melts every single time Jimmy Stewart looks at Margaret Sullivan. It's so sweet. But the thing that has always stuck with me is that last scene with Mr. Vodacek where he's find, trying to find someone to spend Christmas with and he finally manages to find it in Rudy, the little stock boy um, who's just started there. I just, I find that to be such a beautiful and, and moving little moment in a movie that is kind of unexpectedly moving and unexpectedly melancholic um in a really beautiful way so yeah that's my thoughts on this movie what about you i'm gonna take away that same scene too aside from you know me feeling like i want to watch this again but i found that scene to be very powerful and i also really liked the balance of you know another thing that can really bother me about romance movies is that i feel like they can glorify romantic relationships above any other type of relationship. And I think that friendships can be just as, if not more beautiful than romantic relationships, depending on, you know, the scenario. And I really like how this movie ends with kind of um, closure on big relational needs, but in different ways. You know, we have this this couple coming together, obviously in a romantic way, but then we also have this, you know, older man and this younger boy who are both like, you know, we're lonely and we need a friend and we need some sort of, you know, relationship in our life on this, on this night where people typically gather with those that they love. 
And I don't know. I just really like that we have this beautiful friendship, this birth of a friendship happening as well um, in kind of an unexpected way. So, um, yeah, I I just I found I found that scene to be really, really touching uh, because it starts in a really sad in a really sad way um, and ends in a way that feels very satisfying and, and sweet and beautiful. So, yeah, I like that scene a lot. All right. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. (laughs) I really love talking about this movie. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at yourpickpod at gmail.com. Our theme song was composed by Joel Rushton, and our podcast graphic was designed by Kara Shin. If you like this show and want to hear more, please write and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're excited to have you on this journey with us. Till next time. <clears throat> there are a lot of things you don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, should I go for Jimmy Stewart? No, no. Do it. <laughs> Wait, it seriously, off. do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> well, he's not really like, he gets more Jimmy Stewart as he gets older. He's not really that He's not Jimmy full Stewart. on Jimmy Stewart here. Yeah, he's young Jimmy Stewart. Do, do, do <clears throat> a little, do do a little Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> I don't know if I can do a little Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> I'll think Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart. I don't know if any of it's going to come out. <clears throat> okay.